Undertale is a video game made by Toby Fox in 2000. Hold on, let me just skip the boring parts. My favorite part of Undertale comes somewhere in the middle. Several times throughout the game, you run into a melancholy ghost named Nabstabluk. He's cute, kind of like if Marvin the Robot in Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy was an ambient musician. You can go to his house and hang out with him and he'll play you some of his tracks. They're all unique, and each time he laments his lack of musical ability. It's a nice moment, made even nicer when Nabstabluk suggests you lay on the floor with them and listen to the music together. You never pass up an opportunity like that, so you lay on the carpet, stare up at what would be a ceiling, and then... My mom called to ask me my plans for Thanksgiving, and I said I was still figuring them out. Thanksgiving's tomorrow, she said fucking blew my mind. I guarantee you in 10 years historians will look back at this period of time and say that we lived through mass trauma. Anyone who forgot most of their shitty high school experience has been told it's because of trauma or has read about how memory loss is common when experiencing depression. Well, when historians inevitably say that, I hope we can all give them a collective fuck off. We've been saying it for two years now and no one is listening. I swear we are being forgotten. An entire generation left to die. Talking about Thanksgiving really dates that. I think it also lends a sense of scale to which this project, this video, has infected my mind. And helps with that sense of scale when time's sense of scale has become so useless. If you were to ask me what year it was, I'd probably still say March of 2020. On some days I might be generous and say sometime in 2021. But I would never say present day, present time. Why do I keep thinking about that moment in Undertale? I remember in March of 2020 when all the YouTube essayists were releasing their big pandemic videos. There was Philosophy Tube talking about finding beauty in trying times. I liked that one, that was good. I also remember Folding Ideas talking about contagion and finding some kind of comfort and watching it over and over and over again. Really good essay. And there were all the people on Twitter baking bread or whatever, talking about how hard it was after a few days or a few weeks. It really annoyed me. Even then. Now, it's two years later and we're still here. But the public gaze has drifted off somewhere else. I missed out on having that collective space to grieve. I caught COVID for the second time just last month, and talking about it felt like a burden I was putting on people. Like no one truly cared. I mean, not even I could care because I had to keep working. My partner caught it too, and they couldn't stop working to care either. Those two weeks that I spent isolated made me feel so detached from humanity. Again. Like I was no longer real. It was isolating, just like everything else seems to be now. And it made me want to ask, is it too late for me to become cottagecore and bake bread? Are y'all still doing that, or am I supposed to listen to the unmasked people at the grocery store yelling about getting back to work or whatever Fox News bullshit they're mad about this week? And don't get me wrong, I'm not mad at anyone or anything. We each needed and still need our own escape. And I think the ironic thing for me is that 
I worked from home for my office job as soon as the pandemic hit. And then I moved to working at home for me and my self-employment. So sitting at the computer is work. Maybe the collective grieving on social media missed me because in my head, I was always on the clock. It's hard not to feel that way here in America. I I don't know what to put right here. I really hate editing. <laughs> I keep thinking about this moment in Undertale. I think about it more and more as time goes by. Jacob Geller asks the question in his video, The Future of Writing About Games. What is the shelf life of a video game in your mind? Can you count the hours you spend thinking about it as part of the playtime? And it's so weird because, of course I liked Undertale. But it is this moment, and this moment solely, that sticks with me and has stuck with me for years. It grows stronger with each passing day. It is up there in the hall of memories with the moment I stood in front of a Jackson Pollock painting for the first time, the massive canvas engulfing me. Several hundred pixels on the screen have engulfed me. I believe it was Trent Reznor who said, I believe I can see the future because I repeat the same routine. Every day is exactly the same. It's hard to escape. I mean, it's reality for most of us at this point. And no one really prepared us for it as kids. Ask anyone when they feel they are right now and most people will answer sometime in 2020, maybe 2021 but I don't think anyone will tell you today. No one will say present, present day. day. <laughs> present, present time. time. <laughs> Lane is a loser, but unlike today's modern losers, Lane knows nothing of the internet. A blessing maybe, but it's the jumping off point for the entirety of this anime. It aired in and maybe when it was airing, the speculative sci-fi seemed impossible or even strange. But now? The show begins when her classmate nose dies from a roof and something weird happens. Everyone, Lane included, gets an email from the now dead classmate. Lane's mind, not comprehending the simple fact that the classmate could have just delayed the arrival of the email so that no one would interfere with her attempt, or that the internet might have just been slow so the email could have taken a while to travel to everyone's inboxes, thinks that she is being contacted from beyond the grave. I don't get it. In quick succession, Lane is confronted with mortality for the first time in her life in the form of her classmate dying, and maybe even more traumatically, taking her own life in public view, but then is also confronted with communication from that classmate post-mortem. This spurs Lane into a new obsession with computers, as a way for her to try and understand how someone can live beyond death. The show frames it as meeting God or becoming God. Lane is just a child and is coming to grips with the fact that everyone dies. The universe too shall die, and only those who leave a large impact will be remembered. She is contending with the fact that we will always remember the Beatles, we will always remember Stonehenge, we will always remember the Mona Lisa, but we will not remember her friend. Despite the gruesome way in which she died, the other classmates move on rather quickly. Like, next episode. So, Julie, are you still getting email? Email? You know, from Chisa? Oh, that. The philosopher Rody Walker wrote a song about this called C'est la vie, where he paints several situations in which people end their own lives and the minimal impact those moments have on the world at large. He doesn't dive into the trauma or horror that act can put on the individual's life, 
and instead focuses specifically on the grand scheme, the existential reality that jumping in front of a train will only delay the train 15 minutes. It will make the news, but briefly. He says, Disease in your genes and ocean levels on the rise. Sing a song of living before everybody dies. He sang this in 2011. At that point, the climate clock in New York City would have been at 18 years and 200 days. Today, it's... It's a song maybe more important now than it was back then. Just as Lane is maybe a more impactful show now, showing us a form of reality versus when it aired as a piece of speculation. Or something like that. I don't know if humans were meant to know so much. The job of a politician, the job of being informed of politics and representing a community almost seems redundant. For those that spend their time on the internet, it's other working class people that keep each other informed. Every day you're reading about the worst shit imaginable. For the first time in history, a single person can see the death of human rights, the growth of hateful rhetoric, the uselessness of online debate, and the latest layoffs at Netflix, all in a 10-minute scroll. I remember when doom scrolling was a phrase being coined and passed around, and I thought it ridiculous. For the most part, I don't decide to see these things or decide what I see, unless you consider going on Twitter to be me granting permission for it. Being informed is not a question anymore. You will be informed. You will be shown the horrors of the world and told to go to work the next day. You will be shown the people in power tweeting instead of taking action, pretending that they're just like you, that all they can do is stare at the horror instead of take action. I don't know if humans were meant to know widespread and irreversible impacts, and when scientists say stuff like that, uh, you know, uh, National Center for Atmospheric Research, Lawrence Livermore, Pop Sanders. The first time I saw First Reformed and got to this moment, I thought of Undertale. But this is a scene that comes late into the movie after a lot of things have happened. And the two characters share this strange but intimate moment together, lying on the floor, one on top of the other, and the entire world just fades away. The imagery is beautiful. It could easily be Nabs the Blue and me lying there, listening to music and fading away from reality. But then, it spoils. And God, if it doesn't feel like the last two years are spoiling, rotten through and through, time itself wilting into just a soup. It doesn't matter what year it is or what month it is because the same shit just keeps happening with nothing new to show for it. Except when that something new is something even worse. First Reformed is a film about finding something in the absence of God. It offers this choice between despair and hope, a new religion or something else. Ernst Toller, our main character, is a man for which America and God have forsaken him. America took his child from him during the Iraq War, and the church has stuffed him into a nothing chapel known unaffectionately as the gift shop. He suffers from alcoholism that's killing him. He writes angsty journals to himself and Ethan Hawke narrates them. He has no friends. His wife left him. He's lost, floating in the void. Until he meets Mary, a pregnant woman who is part of his congregation. She needs help because her husband wants her to have an abortion. Well he wanted. Now he just doesn't want a kid. She's far along, and he's deep in the weeds about it. Mary wants Ernst to talk to him and help him sort out his feelings. You know, preacher stuff. 
we learn that Mary's husband is basically really fucking depressed, completely overcome with despair. He was slash is a climate activist. He's chained himself to machines. He's protested. He's lost friends to police. He's fought, and the rewards of that is nothing but destruction. He has the research. He knows of the doomsday clock. He doesn't want to bring a child into this world. And there's nothing that Ernst can really say to help him. Because he's lost too. He's lost his child to his beliefs, his trust in America, his beliefs in God. None of that stuff saved his kid or his marriage. So what can he really say? You know, a, a child is so full of hope and naive beliefs into a world where that little girl, uh, she grows up to be a young woman and she looks you in the eyes and she says that you knew this all along, didn't you? You see that? I mean, what, what are you supposed to say then? Mary's husband takes his own life. I'm reminded of Lane. Both Lane and First Reformed face the main characters with trauma, and in response to that trauma, they develop new beliefs. And they aren't the most healthy. Mary discovers that her husband had a suicide vest stashed in the garage. No idea what he was going to use it for, but the effects of it would be the same. Ernst takes it from Mary so the police don't discover it, to protect Mary. But the information that the husband presented him before he died about climate disaster, it infects his brain to the point that he straps the vest on and is going to use it at his own church. He's going to use it as some form of a protest or something. I don't, I don't really know what to call it. In a strange mirror to Lane, the new beliefs that he gains leads to despair. A despair so deep that he only sees one escape. What pushes him to do this, though, is that moment that reminded me of Undertale. When he has this moment of intimacy with Mary and sees true beauty in the world for maybe the first time in his life. But then it turns into destruction of the world. It makes me think about burnout. About how everything feeds into this despair that I feel. That I think a lot of us are feeling. It's nearly every day that I see something on Twitter that makes me feel so empty. But I don't want to lay down like Ernst. I don't want to disappear like Lane. I don't want to close my eyes and see the destruction of the world. I just want to escape for a little while and maybe come back with a renewed sense of purpose. I don't I don't know what this video is. I'm I'm going to stop it here. I took a trip a few months ago. Just me and a rental car. I drove south out of Chicago and made my way down 57 to my hometown. On the trip I found myself slipping into only yesterday territory. Old memories dredging up and making themselves clear again. Riding my bike through the park and remembering my dad standing on the wooden bridge feeding the ducks. Riding down a back street and remembering the treehouse my friend had and all the time we spent hidden up there. These things were bleeding into my reality and took me out of myself for a while. Kind of like that moment in Undertale. Only Yesterday is a special film to me because it tells you that keeping your childhood with you, even as you age, isn't a detriment and that maybe it's inevitable, but most people just ignore it. The imagery of the film is dreamlike and surreal, 
but in the most mundane of ways. The main character rides the train away from her new love, and the car is packed with her old classmates. They convince her to turn around during the credits, turning a sour ending into a sweet one. Memory has power in Only Yesterday. The power to make sadness and happiness. The power to affect others when you lay your story on them. It even has the power to help you escape reality. In one scene, the main character is remembering her first crush and the awkward, cute conversation they had in the streets after a baseball game. When it's over, she turns and runs off down the road, and her steps carry her up up and into the sky until she's flying.